Hi guys, thank you so much for coming tonight. My name is Ajel and I am the program director at UIRC. Tonight for our second Ask Me Anything, we have our two therapists from UIRC, Allison Brown and Whitney Burrell. Uh, Allison, I will have you introduce yourself first because you are literally the first box below mine. So that's why you got special treatment. Okay. And then we will move on to Whitney. So Allison, take it away. Perfect. So my name's Allison Brown. Um, I graduated in 2018 and I have been a therapist with Utah Infertility Resource Center for about three years now. Um, I also work another therapy job doing court-ordered substance abuse and domestic violence. So I have a little training in that as well. Perfect. Thank you. Whitney, you're up. Right. My name is Whitney Burrell. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and I went to the University of Utah and graduated in 2009. So I've been in um, private practice for about 10 years and then um, working for UIRC um, sort of in different capacities since it began. So I, um, I see both folks who are dealing with infertility as well as um, maternal mental health. So that could be like postpartum anxiety. Um, uh, I'm really interested in, in working with families who are, who are choosing to build their families in maybe what could be called non-traditional ways. So that could be adoption or um, surrogacy or third-party reproduction. Um, I came to this uh, specialty both based on interest and then personal experience related to my own infertility. infertility. Um, so I went through several rounds of IVF and then we pivoted and um, decided to build our family with domestic adoption. So I have two young girls that came to us through domestic adoption. Um, yeah, and I really like working both with couples who are um, dealing with fertility challenges or building their families or women, um, or, you know, folks who are pursuing a path of family building as a single person. Um, so, yeah, happy to answer any questions or hopefully provide some support. UIRC has uh, such a great um, resource for folks in our community, and I'm really glad to be connected to them. You did a much Thanks. better job than I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, I Allison, is there anything you want to add? Jump in. Um, so I have not personally experienced infertility, um, but I'm a surrogate. So I understand a lot of the, um, processes that go in place. I've done five rounds of IVF and a mock cycle. Um, we've been lucky to, uh, I had a little boy about two years ago, who's now with his parents, um, happy and healthy. So while I have my, my perspective comes from a very different direction than Whitney's, but still think it's very valid and um what Definitely. I love about UIRC is something like we realize that infertility doesn't just focus on infertility once you have a baby that doesn't change or fix that um and it affects different areas of your life so we're here to help through that process whatever that looks like for you thank you and I am so glad that we get to call you ours so thank you for being mm -hmm. ours um, and I will jump in kind of with one of our questions that relate to that. Since you are, our, since you are ours, um, tell me a little bit about just the, the therapy options at UIRC um, and what someone could, what's the best way to say it? Like just, yeah, what are our options if they come to you at UIRC? Allison, let's start with you. Um. First of all, our therapists are, um, have received training through either their own ex personal experience with infertility or through the American Society of Reproductive Medicine. So we have specific training that addresses infertility itself, and that's after all of our graduate studies and everything else. Um, so we are uniquely, not uniquely, because there's other pe people that do this, but we are qualified in that way um, to offer that we understand a little bit more of the dynamic that goes along with 
some of the medications and those type of things. Next question we have is how often, if if I did start with either of you, how often should I expect the, the treatment to go or to see you? Is there a common path for that? Whitney? Sure. Um, I, that's really kind of determined by, um, uh, the client and the therapist. So what you okay. could expect from like a first session would be, um, information gathering and uh, talking through what your concerns are and maybe identifying some goals for how you want to spend your time in sessions. Um, uh, you know, and I think that really, it's also, I mean, can be determined by sort of financial resources. Um, I would say folks probably, I don't know if there's an average, it really depends, maybe six to eight sessions, probably fair average. Um, um, I think, Adele, you made a good point earlier, or I'm not sure who said it, maybe Allison about um, infertility sort of doesn't end or sometimes doesn't feel like it ends even when you have a baby or a baby enters your home or a child enters your home somehow. I often call it infertility part two with my clients because if they become pregnant, then they're not like the like um, average uh, pregnant person, right? So they, they often know about losses and, and uh, and sort of what the risks are. So I think that anxiety continues into the pregnancy and then even into parenting. Uh, um, you know, parenting is, it, I think, post-infertility parenting is, a, is different. I would assume is probably different than what um, folks who don't deal with infertility may experience. So, um, so that's a sort of long answer for like, it depends maybe is the short answer of that. But I could expect at our first meeting, we would kind of create like a, a plan or a ballpark idea of maybe what would suit my needs and where we would go from there. Is that kind of what I would expect on that first meeting overall? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Oh, I like this one. This one was what if you've never been to therapy? Do I just show up and plop myself down and then we come up with a plan? Is that like day one? Would that be kind of, how would you describe our first visit? Allison, we'll go back and forth. You're up. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, <laughs> so our first visit, Whitney kind of already went into it. So first visit, we're going to gather information. So we're going to be gathering information about like about your journey, like where you're at in your journey, what it looks like for you, what challenges you faced, those type of things. Um, and it's it's an interesting thing because you sit down in front of a complete stranger and spill your guts. But of course, you don't have to spill your guts, right? You share what you feel is important and what you feel is necessary. We're not going to ask you to share, uh, you know, tell me about everything from the moment you remember, like how far back do you remember? We're going to ask you some more important things about what it looks like for you now. Um, you know, if you want to go back to your childhood, we can, but <laughs> we're looking at stuff of what's currently going on. So we can create a proper treatment plan and a goals to move forward with. Perfect. It looks like we do have a question in our chat. It says, what are some coping types when you don't get the results you hope for? I'm going to mm. actually throw this to both of you since you have different perspectives. Whitney, let's start with you. What What are some things when you don't get whatever those results were, you've been let down or your hopes changed a little bit? Sure. Yeah, great question. I think um, uh, what a common experience experience, especially in infertility. I mean, likely if people are pursuing treatment, like they've already had some experience of time passing without being um, successful on their own, right? So <laughs> sort of like clockwork that every month when there's confirmation that you're not expecting the pretty um, people really get understandably sort of uh, 
stuck in that cycle or pretty frustrated by that experience. So, um, yeah, I think developing some coping strategies around what, like, how, um, what do you need? What is there, um, when that happens, when there's either like a, a your, um, a failed cycle or um, even just like a, a your cycle returns, your period comes and it's confirmation that you're not pregnant. What is there? Um, what do you need? Uh, who is in who is in your support system? If there are folks that are there, um, does that mean like a, some time to spend on your own? Do you need distraction? Um, I think that one is uh, uh, underutilized or maybe not well respected in the mental health world, but world, but certainly an effective one. Um, distracted. I, yeah, distraction. Yeah. Um, I love this. Uh, one woman that I spoke to talked about how, and this really related to how I experienced infertility, how, um, you know, when you watch like C-SPAN or whatever, and there's like the ticker at the bottom and it's showing stocks or I don't know what it's reporting on something. Um, she was like, that's how I feel kind of in the world. Like I'm out at the grocery store doing whatever I'm supposed to do, but kind of always yeah. at, at the bottom of my experience is like, will I ever be pregnant? Will I ever be a mom? Will this cycle fail? What will we do after that? How are we going to earn tens of thousands more dollars to cover this? So that kind of overwhelming duality of, yeah, sure. I'm in the world doing things, but there's this sort of constant underlying grief and anxiety around what you're experiencing is really like um I think a common experience for folks so I guess some strategies too that's why I say distraction because I think it can often be such a common experience for people to just be like perseverating about it uh, that's all they think about um and it's really easy to sort of have tunnel vision about it um I think moving I mean it's the same kind of annoying things that people always say right like moving your body getting outside, sunshine, um, social support. There's no reason why people continuously say those annoying things, and partly because there's some truth to those. So. <laughs> they might yeah. actually do something. Mm -hmm. I think, I think there's some, there's some evidence of that. Yeah. Allison, is there anything else you want to add on to that? Um, I would say also, uh, allowing yourself to grieve a little bit and knowing when grieving is too much, like when I need to ask for help from my support system. Like if I'm not getting out of bed for days on end, I probably need to reach out to somebody. Um, but I think allowing yourself some time and some space to grieve, which I think can be really hard because once a cycle has failed, there's a rush of like, I got to figure out what I'm going to do next. And sometimes the doctor's offices don't really help because they're like, Hey, your blood test came back and you're not pregnant or it didn't work. And what do you want to do? And you don't have a lot of time to figure that out. And I think it's okay to say, you know what? I don't know what I want to do. Can you give me a sec? Can you give me a day? Can you give me whatever time that I need to figure that out? And I think it's okay. I think it's, we want to push on through because we're working towards a goal, but I think it's okay to take breaks from treatment when you need to and allow yourself that time. That's a really good point. I remember that it was, it was in the same phone call, like this didn't work. What's next? Same phone call, same breath. And it was, there was no processing time like at all. So that's, that's great advice. And sometimes that feels like they don't care. And I don't think that's at all the case. I think they do care, but they're also wanting to help you reach your goal. Yeah. And I'll add something too. Um, I'm the director at UARC, but also a therapist. <clears throat> and so I just want to like throw out a big validation for the fact that um, you're right. A lot of these like standard coping things might not work um, because it's a, this is big. It's really, really big. Um, but both Allison and Whitney are so spot on that um I think the practice and the longitudinal um, consistency of coping strategies, like knowing what works for you and keeping it as a practice, like, um, like walking outside, I know makes me feel better. So I'm going to do it every day, even if I don't want to. And I know I'm going to feel even a little bit better 
And so I think that consistency over time can just kind of raise your coping uh, like bucket, you know, like what you can deal with even a little tiny bit. And it may just be a little tiny bit because what you're dealing with is heavy, heavy stuff. And also adjusting your expectations, like Allison was saying, like you're grieving, you're you're going through all of this. And at the same time, you're also grieving. And so adjusting that expectation of what normal is going to look like you for a while, look like for you for a while, I think is fine. Like, yeah, you're not going to be cheering Miss sunshine right now. And that's okay. Mm-hmm. You know, figure out your normal and what's what you can deal with and what other people can deal with with you. <laughs> So that's, I just wanted to add that like consistency and expectation. Totally. I wanted to piggyback a piece on that real quick. I, I think Shelly's spot on and I, what I see so much, I, I don't know if this is just anecdotal or these are the kind of folks that show up because we like vibe and I'm the same as them. But I, I think there's something to like uh, men or women who are used to like okay the world plays by certain rules like if I work really hard at school then I'll achieve or if I work really hard at my job I'll like climb the ladder and then you like are like okay cool infertility I can be like the greatest patient that's ever lived and I will take my meds at the right time and I will like use crystals and do all sorts of weird stuff I may not do but I can like excel at being an infertility patient and it just doesn't play by those rules at all so it feels really like the coping strategies that I know that have worked for me that I feel like pay off just don't work and that can feel really um sort of disorienting I I feel like having like a, a large large toolbox of different coping strategies as well because I think even with this like all these different pieces are so complex that like oh, normally I use this type of coping, but it's not working. Like um, whoever asked this question, thank you for asking it. Um, so I need to have backups. I need to have like, if, if going outside and going for a walk doesn't work, okay, now what do I want to try? Do I want to try some meditation or some yoga? Great. If that doesn't work, maybe I'm going to craft. Maybe I'm going to do something else that I normally don't do um, to kind of get that out. Um, and I'm going to shamelessly plug therapy. Therapy is great coping. (laughs) And I have, there's a study out there that said, um, therapy increases, um, your likelihood to conceive while dealing with infertility. I will get the research out, uh, of a study to you. We can post it on our Facebook page and on our Instagram. Um, I have slideshows from a presentation that I went to. So Well, and I think on a, on a personal note too, I, when I was going through my struggles, I didn't go to therapy. Um, and just starting with UIRC, I think it was Shelly who, who made some comment about how, um, infertility takes away your loss of control or that feeling of control, because there is a loss of control. And she said this, and I've got my nine planners, my one foot highlighter. And I'm like, well, that, wow. I mean, you just described me in five seconds. But I had never realized that that was, that that was it, like that that was the piece. And it would have been so helpful to at least put a name to that. Like part of my struggle is I am a massive control freak and that's why this hits so hard. And maybe, maybe having that route of knowing why it's hurting me in this particular avenue may have helped to have a therapist talk about Instead of, I mean, it was just a passing comment that Shelly had made. I seriously looked down at my planners and went, yeah, that's probably it. <laughs> did the chicken or the egg though? Were you like that before or did infertility make you that way? I think I was born that way. I think yeah. it could go either way. Cause I think <laughs> yeah. it almost forces you to have that control. Cause like Whitney said, I'm going to be the best infertility patient ever. I'm going to take my meds the second they tell me to take them or yeah. you know, it's, 5 30 it's time for my medication I'm already like drawn it out or I already have what I need like I'm gonna do this and it's that sense of grasping for control in a situation where the control has been taken from us yeah that's such a good point okay let's see let's move back to some questions 
Okay. I like this one. What if I don't mesh well with you? Like we're all unique individuals and there's no guaranteeing this is going to work. How do you kindly say, yeah, no, this isn't, this isn't going to work out. <laughs> uh, Allison, let's start with you this time. Um, I'm not offended if I'm not your cup of tea. I don't have to be everybody's cup of tea. Um, I've had people who've ghosted me. That's fine. If you're not comfortable to approach and say, you know what, you're not my cup of tea. That's okay. Um, cause I think it's kind of hard to beyond like the therapist, um, relationship or the therapeutic relationship. How often do we tell people in our lives, like, sorry, you're not my cup of tea. <laughs> like that's not very often. Yeah. And this is, that's a no. hard thing to do is to be like, I've spent time with you and this isn't vibing. If you feel like, you know what? I don't feel like we're on the right path. Can we readdress? I think that's a great segue, but also we're just not vibing. I think that's appropriate to say. Um, or I feel like, do you recommend anybody else? I would not be offended at all to not be the right therapist for you, but I would love to help you find the right therapist. We have amazing therapist at UIRC. Um, but also we know other amazing therapists within the Valley. So I think that's okay. Um, but it is hard to say, mm, uh, it's not vibing. I'm sorry. <laughs> what do you think, Whitney? Yeah, totally. I'm with you on that. I think too, um, I, I often tell clients that kind of the beginning of our sessions, like, Hey, we know from research that that this therapeutic relationship is a big change agent. Like it doesn't if I you whatever modality I decide you and I agree on, or like I can try this and I can try this, great, we'll do that. And this piece, this like connection that's feeling seen, feeling heard, feeling understood, feeling like there's some um alliance there is is a big piece. And so yeah, I don't, I don't think therapists feel, we know that and, and, uh, we know how important that is. And so it's not, uh, I love when clients are like, yes, this isn't a fit. I'm like, perfect. Let's just like Allison said, let's find someone who is. That's There's actually like an app that does that. I mean, we have dating apps. Why can't we have like a therapist? <laughs> Swipe left or right. <laughs> yeah. They don't right. look like they're my cup of tea. <laughs> I think that's right. so good to hear because even just like when you find somebody to cut your hair and you're like, oh, I'm never seeing this person again, <laughs> but then you feel guilty. We do. We don't in our daily lives. We never walk up to someone and be like, you know, this isn't working out for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I'm going to move on. And so it does feel weird. So it's comforting to just see both of you and your perspective that it's okay. And that you will help me find someone else because finding someone is probably one of the hardest battles within itself. And I think Winnie, like we said, we're okay to help you. Like we know who else is out there in this niche of client or of people. Like, so we would love to help mm -hmm. you. We don't care if you get help with us. We just want to help you. That's why we work in helping profession. Is there, is it just for women at, at, I mean, I know in therapy, it's for everybody, but at UIRC, is anyone invited or how do I, how would I set that up? Is it, is it different somehow if I bring my spouse? Whitney, we'll sure. throw that one to you. Um, <clears throat> no, however, that I sort of back to that question of like, how do we want the sessions to look? I think it's pretty common for, um, more often than not, I would say women are initiating the like contact and setting things up. It doesn't have to be that way, but that seems to be the way that it goes. And sometimes maybe we'll do a couple of sessions. And if um, she uh, has a partner and says there's some conflict here, we it's it's also very common, I think, for partners to want to like the speed of um accessing treatment or making decisions on how to build a family that that's often I think it's rare for partners to be on the same page that way so um hmm. when I perk up to like oh there's something here that that this person is identifying then I'll say like how would it feel to bring your partner to one of these sessions and maybe this is a space where we could talk through some of that and they can opt in or out um yeah so that's that's absolutely an appropriate use of 
session time. Do I have to wait for you to suggest it or can I just begin my treatments that way with like yeah. a couple? Sure. Yeah. I mean, okay. I think people learn hopefully pretty quick, like in the, if they're pursuing treatment or family building, like advocate, like ad, advocating in those domains becomes pretty important. So this is just another domain where, where we hope you feel comfortable, you know, identifying like, here's what's going to work for me. Can we do that? Perfect. And I think it's okay. Like we do see just men, not mm -hmm. super often because most of our, all of our therapists are women, but I think it's really common for spouses to kind of put their own feelings on the back burner because I'm focused on what my wife is going through. You know, so I'm going to put all my stuff on the back burner and help her and support her and, and I'll come back to it. And we all know what that does. It doesn't fix our problems when they come back to them. They're still there. Sometimes they're worse. Sometimes they're not, but they're still there. They've just been festering. That's fair. Okay. Let's see some of our other submitted questions. Since COVID, I guess the, the new question is, is in-person, online, does it matter? How, how would that work once we do get set up? Uh, let's see, we're eeny, meeny, miny, Allison. <laughs> um, I still see, I think Whitney also sees people in person. Um, I still do. I'm out at our office on Meet Me on 33rd, um, once or twice a week, depending on sessions. Um Virtual and in-person are very unique things. Um, I actually had this conversation <laughs> the other day with somebody. Um, in person, there's a very different feel, as we all know, to virtual. Um, what I do love about in-person is that face-to-face, -face, we're really um, connected in a very different way. Um, but what I do also love about virtual is you get to be in your safe space. Like our office is a safe space, right? But yeah. you to be in your safe space in your home, which has a very different feel than our office because it's yours. So whatever works for you. Um, I've seen people all the way down south, all the way up to border of Idaho. Um, those people on the far reaches are usually uh, virtual, but I think it kind of depends on what's convenient for you and what works best. And what you prefer, you know, uh, people are sometimes willing to drive a little bit further to have the in-person because that desire is there. What do you think, Whitney? Do you have a preference? You're on mute, but do you have a preference? Oh, for you're on mute. Virtual, virtual? Sorry. You're fine. Speaking of leftover COVID experiences, like Whitney, <laughs> you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Those ones will pop up. <laughs> um. Yeah, I prefer in person, I think, um, but I'm comfortable with either option. And I think you make a good point of sometimes um, based on location or just like desire to be home or in a safe place. I also have lots of clients who like will like pop on at noon, like on a telehealth and they're like in their car <laughs> during the lunch hour. <laughs> so I have people works. who do that when um, little ears or other yeah. ah. home. So like, oh, sorry, uh, we have guest house guests. So they go and hide. I like that. <laughs> Is there, um, obviously we would set up a, a schedule or whenever the next appointment was, but what if I was going through something, maybe I just got my results back or, um, you know, uh, the news hit particularly hard today, right then and there. Is that something I, I just, could call you or pick up the phone or, or how does that work? I think Whitney and I probably approach this a little bit differently. And I think it, that goes from therapist to therapist. Okay. Um, I have a Google voice that goes straight to my cell phone. My clients get that. Um, it's easier to reach out to me if they, even if they, something as simple as you need to change your appointment, like, Hey, I had something come up. Can we push it out? Um, so my clients are always welcome to text me. Um, I don't, we don't do crisis. Um, but, um, is I'm, that what that's called is crisis? Like when it's like immediate care crisis is more like I'm suicidal. 
Um, oh, okay. So if you're suicidal, I recommend all the hotlines, 911, all of those things. Um, because I don't always immediately get back. So if you're in crisis and you're waiting for me to call you back, I might not get to it, especially on the weekends where my phone's not physically on my person all the time. So, okay. um, but my clients are welcome. I have a few clients who actually never make appointments and just reach out when they need like a little tune up and we always figure something out. A tune up. I like that. Whitney, what's your perspective? How, how do you handle that? Yeah. Same answer as Allison. Okay. Yeah. And email. Email. Okay. That's wonderful. Perfect. Let's see. Get to the next one. Do you offer specific therapies? And I have to admit my ignorance on this one and hope that that makes sense to both of you. Sure. I mean, I assume they're sort of asking like what modalities are used and we can talk about that. Um, yeah, this would also be a good plug for mind body bridging group, which Allison, I'll let you do that part. Um, so, uh, I mean, as therapists, we work similar to uh, like the reproductive endocrinologist you might be seeing where we identify a diagnosis. And then based on that diagnosis, there's like best practices of how do we treat this diagnosis. So if that's PCOS or endometriosis or depression or anxiety or PTSD, um, I would say those are probably the three most common ones that I see in folks. Um, and then based on what that diagnosis is, and, and I would say too, I guess I'll, this seems like an important clarifying point. I don't know that all of the clients I see that are dealing with infertility may, may, may not meet the like full criteria for di for depression, but they're certainly experiencing symptoms of it. And sure. if they're able to say like, you know, I'm not functioning well, or there are things I'd like to address that counts, right? That's uh, reason enough. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's, without getting into like the weeds, there's um, some specific treatments related to depression and anxiety, cognitive behavioral therapy, trauma-focused cognitive, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, I'm trained in EMDR, which is, is traditionally used for folks who have experienced trauma, and that trauma can be defined in lots of ways. The way that I've heard most recently that I like it is like things happening things that have happened to me that are too much or too fast, right? So yeah. when I say trauma, I don't mean like your child died. I mean, that's certainly uh, certainly traumatic, but how can we more broadly define what how people experience trauma? Um, um, yeah, so, and, I, and that's true for the other therapists that work at UIRC. There's other folks trained in EMDR, um, mind body bridging, which I'll let Allison, um, talk through. Yeah. So to kind of go back, if, if I was aware of these different modalities, could I, as the patient choose, or is that something that you, you kind of figure out what modality will work best with my diagnosis? Is that more your discretion? Yeah, no, sure. I mean, just like WebMD, now there's like TikTok, right? So people there you come, go. To, come to me and say like, I want to do internal family systems or like, I want to do parts work or I want to do, uh, I have an anxious attachment style or <laughs> I've been gaslit. And I they've learned this from TikTok partner. and it comes to you. That's great. <laughs> yeah, which, which like, I think is fine, whatever elevates. <laughs> um, mental, you know, like decreases mental health stigma and like awareness. Sure. I don't know that I'm going like, to sign off on you have a narcissistic partner. Cause I don't, I don't know, but, um, <laughs> but, but, uh, sure. I, I like when people sort of bring that and say, I think this could work for me or like my sister did this and I'd be really interested to explore it. Um, it's sort of back to that question. Like, does the, does this make sense for what symptoms you're reporting and 
what I'm trained in and what I feel like could be helpful, but yes, like bring those questions. I mean, I think that's part of like our treatment, our goals, like, um, Hey, I'm trained in, I'm also trained in EMDR. I'm trained in EMDR. Do you know anything about it? Would you like to look into it and feel like if it's a good fit for you? And if you do great. And if you don't great, we got all these other things we can focus on. So, um, and right now we're doing a study with, uh, Utah state university for mind body bridging. Um, so that's great. It helps us with a lot of different things. They've done it, done it with studies on kids and families and um, domestic violence offenders, um, people who have um, been diagnosed with cancer and the effects that it's had on them. So we're currently working with Utah State University to um, see what it does, if it can help um, and be one of the tools for couples dealing with infertility. Could you expand on that a little bit? Is there, is that kind of like an additional modality with that? Is that how you would describe this? Okay. Yeah. So uh, it's a separate modality. All of our therapists have been trained on it. We spent two days in the office um, giggling and learning a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so um, our new, our first group starts at the end of the month and we're hoping to do more in the future. So if it's something that you're interested in, email me. So wonderful that honestly, I just learned so much. I didn't, I liked Winnie. I liked your explanation. Like, here's your diagnosis. We're going to take all of these different routes to get there. That was a great explanation. Totally got that. <laughs> okay. Let's see. I think we're almost near the end. The last question I can see is, can you prescribe medicine or of any kind, or, or is it just a suggestion? How does that work? We prescribe self-care. <laughs> <laughs> Walks, sunlight. <laughs> yeah, good answer. So none of the therapists that are on staff at URC are uh, credentialed or trained to provide medication. Um, I would bet that we all uh, can identify when we might broach the topic of like wondering if, um, if uh, medication might be helpful. Um, I work pretty closely with several prescribers, especially in the domain of kind of like postpartum and, and that, um, that piece. Um, so yeah, that's the short answer of that. We could certainly help folks get connected and, and, you know, collaborate with prescriber for what we're seeing as far as symptoms and and then they would make a determination on what might be a good fit for the client would I have to go see someone else like if it got to a point where I needed it or would benefit for medication does that mean my time with you is over or would I see that person and you go ahead Allison so I think that depends um I think it depends on who's prescribing. Um, a lot of our, uh, the OBGYNs and your family doctor can prescribe that for you, or you can also see a psychiatrist. They are medical doctors, um, NPs, PAs, all of those people who we see somewhat routinely can prescribe those for you. It doesn't necessarily mean that our time is over. Um, okay. I, I personally think um, that it's not an, a one or the other, I think it can be both. Um, and both can fit very well together and be a positive thing for people. Um, and that's also a very personal decision. Like I know a lot of people who don't want to use medications that were kind of against that, um, and would just prefer the therapy route. And I know other people who don't give me the pills. It's the easy thing for what works for my life right now. I don't have time for therapy or I don't have time for X, Y, and Z. I don't have time to go out and take a walk. <laughs> so um, I think it really depends on you, but I think we're capable and able to help you find that piece to make it work for you. Perfect. And I'll Thanks. add to that. Um, okay. Research shows that that meds with therapy work better than meds alone. And I don't know that, you know, like if you 
are on meds the rest of your life, which a lot of people are, and that's totally cool. Um, I don't know that means you have to be in therapy that all that time, but research does, does show that they really go together well, um, to support each other. I could definitely understand why that would be the case. Okay, I think, let's see, we are at the end of our submitted questions. I have a sort of topic that might be applicable if you want me to throw something in or if you got other. Please do. Okay. No, go ahead. Um, I think, and we can riff off this, I'm sure. I think um, a common thing that I talk to um, Ajal, it's kind of like you mentioned when Shelly said um, infertility has its a lot to do with loss of control and just having someone point that out. It's sort of like, Oh, no wonder I feel like I'm losing my mind or this, this is such a big deal. Um, that's another piece that I think people often say, like, I've dealt with hard things in my life. Why is this one like having such an impact on me? Um, and I think that's partly just because it impacts so many domains. It's like, who am I as a, as a person? Um, Wait, mute, unmute. Sorry. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> not happy to listen to my cough. Um, what's my purpose in life? What's my role um, within my family if I'm not going to parent? Who am I in my faith community if I'm not a parent? Um, financially, how, how this impacts folks. Um, intimacy and sexuality. Um, I remember thinking like on a very like basic level as just a, like a mammal, <laughs> my part of my like role in the evolution of time is to procreate and like, wow, I can't do that part. So, um, so I think people, there's all these, um, whether you're having that conscious of a thought or not, that's, that's a common experience for folks. And I think having a therapist point out like these are all really um, common experiences or things that people are, uh, that come with infertility. I mean, the loss of control around timelines or like how, how you, the, the time frame you want to build your family, privacy, um, your like medical information, uh, or, um, is it now, sometimes shared with people they are wondering like not only when are you going to have kids but then if you sort of share if you're in treatment what that timeline is and they're like following up with you so there's just um I think even when when people don't bring that up I often share that information just as a way to normalize the experience and people to get hooks in why this feels so traumatic and and all-encompassing because there's really little pieces everywhere, for sure. Well, even just the expectation of how you thought, you know, it was going to go. It, it feels so silly to say that those expectations meant so much. I remember thinking I was so excited to tell people. Like, I was excited to be that one where just on a random Thursday, I got to surprise everybody and you didn't see it coming. As opposed to everyone knowing the date of my blood draws, everyone knowing the date of this. And, and it was like my support system changed because there were no surprises. Everybody knew the dates of everything. And so I never, I didn't get that moment that I had thought I would always get. And it seems so stupid to hold on to that. And yet I think it was kind of meaningful that something as small of that was taken away. So just those expectations of even that gets, you know, taken away. Yeah, exactly. I think another piece, oh, sorry. Whitney. I think another piece of it that goes is like, now that everybody knows when your appointments are, when your blood draws are, um, everybody knows when you're going to find out. Right. Yeah. And so it's okay. I, ha I don't have time to feel my feelings because now I have to manage everybody else's emotions because everybody else in my support group, while they're wonderful and amazing, and I greatly appreciate them, I now have to manage their disappointment or their reactions to my news instead of just focusing on me. 
wow, that's yeah, a killer point. Because mm-hmm. there isn't there just like that phone call when they say what's next, that turnaround time where you get to internalize your own whatever. You need to give your yourself that space to acknowledge and be okay with that for a minute before you have to deal with everybody else. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So very true. Shelly, is there anything else you wanted to add? I know you're looking at our list of questions too from those that were submitted. Um, Did I get all of our docs? Yeah, pretty much. Um, I'll just add that uh, two other little things that we offer that a lot of other places even that do work with infertility don't offer. I mean, some do, but is uh, that we do third-party evaluations for folks who will be, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, you guys, but um, for folks who need uh, obviously some kind of third-party material, like an embryo, sperm, egg donation, those kind of things. We have to do an evaluation just to kind of make sure you understand everything that's involved in the process, um, make sure you're like stable and feeling okay. Anything else to add to that? Um, You two with regard to third-party evaluations. Okay. So we do offer those and we um, are happy to do those. We can usually get people in pretty quick and get um, your report turned around, you know, within a few days, a week at the most. Um, And the other thing that we offer that not everybody does is a sliding fee scale. So If you've got, um, you know, tons of, obviously you've got tons of other expenses and let's say you are in school, you're only making $50,000 a year. We will cut down that, what our normal fee is, um, like if you don't have insurance um, so that we can get you in. Our goal is to provide service and we don't want to exclude people because they, Um, are struggling financially. So we want to help people as much as we can. We have to stay in business, but we, we want to do our best to help people. So those two things is uh, all I think I need to add. Um, And we do uh, for the third party valuations, we are available on Saturdays, which I don't think other places are. You just need to ask if that's something that you need. Um, Not many of us do therapy on the weekends, though. We get our time and space too. (laughs) <laughs> that is fair. <laughs> well, ladies, thank you so much for coming. I think we got pretty close to our hour. So thank you for spending almost an hour with us. We appreciate it. Um, Allison, I know, I believe you're uh, accepting new clients, um, yes. especially with this new program. Are both of you accepting new clients or this new modality? Should I, is that what I call it? <laughs> I'm learning. Yeah. Yeah. Mind body bridging folks. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. Probably full. Sorry. Our first group is probably full, but um, if you're still interested, I would love to put you into our next group um, or groups in the future. Perfect. Do we know when the next group would begin just so we could throw that out there if anybody asks? Not yet. Shelly and I are meeting to discuss that. We probably won't know. This first one is going to be eight weeks long. So we probably won't know okay. toward, until towards the end of that. So um, we're talking like end of April, beginning of May-ish before we start to have those conversations because we've got to get through this first group first. That's so, fair. Am I mute? Oh, um, so probably summer. Okay. Perfect. And then they can still reach out to us and we can collect their information and yeah, mm-hmm. keep them close by. Yeah. And, and just, uh, you know, if you're questioning, you want to just do therapy in the meantime, um, you know, our therapists do know the modality. Um, the nice thing about this study group is you'll be in a group with a, um, a trainer from Utah State University, and then we support that with your weekly therapy sessions. So you would get kind of two hits a week um, to learn how to do this yourself and then be supported by your therapist. That sounds great. And what I, I'm going to do one last plug. I'm sorry. Uh, What I do love about our therapists is um, I've had people tell me, okay, well, I'm doing this. And then they start to explain whatever treatment it is that they're doing. And we're we're like, oh no, I already know what that is. 
and mm-hmm. it, you you get to waste less of your therapy time explaining what that process looks like because we already know. And so it cuts out some of that time and we can focus more on what you need and what is concerning to you. Kind of that hit the ground running. Don't waste any time. Just jump in. That yeah. sounds very nice. Do you agree with me? Do you experience that as well? Totally. I think people are like, great. I don't have to, I don't have to explain what the acronyms are. And I've had one, I'm sure this is rare, but one woman was like, you know, I think when you're not in the infertility world, you you sort of don't realize the lengths people are going through to, to build their family. So she was like, yeah, when I told my therapist, we were spending 20 grand on like an IVF cycle, her, her like jaw dropped, but like, yeah, of course you are. (laughs) Yes, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, and I think you spend enough. Yeah, you spend enough of your personal time educating, educating everybody else another, about totally. infertility. Why do you need to do that with your therapist? Mm-hmm. Yep, right. We'll yeah, give you a therapy's great. Like I, I don't know <laughs> who else. What other space do you have where someone listens really intently to you and you know withholds judgment and really sees you as a full person and. Um, I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think, I think if people have hesitations about it, um, I think most of the time those are pretty unfounded. Once they start, they're like, oh yeah, okay. I, this feels really good. Um, and I think Powerful if you stuff. have hesitations, um, come to our conference in September, all mm. of our therapists have, are there for a chunk of the day. Come have a yeah. conversation with us. We're not going to give you free therapy because that's not what we're there for, but (laughs) you know, we're people come have a conversation. See if this is a good feel for us, you know, come and talk to Whitney. Do I like Whitney? Yeah, I do. I'm going to see if I can set up an appointment with her. Mm -hmm. Come find your cup of tea. (laughs) Please do. You don't have to uh, have a tea night or something. There you go. Yeah. It's like, come have a cup of tea. We won't spill the tea. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> it almost sounds like we need to set up a therapy, like meet the therapist speed date. <laughs> totally. We, yeah. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Like Next where week. we rotate. We, yeah. We, that's a great idea, actually. It's really a good idea. It really is. Mm-hmm. I love that. Well, ladies, thank you so much for spending your night with us. We are so glad that you are ours. And I cannot not promise that I will find you and make you do this again. So I appreciate you now. And I hope uh, I can bring you back sometime too. 